Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Jack Post Up Close webinar, Declining Rate of Deforestation. Is it the new normal? Today, we will discuss about the good news that we have heard recently about Indonesia has managed to reduce its deforestation. Some praise the government for the good news. Others are skeptical, saying that this is just because of the economic downturn during the pandemic. We will have representatives from the Environment and Forestry Ministry as well as international experts that have been following the Indonesian government's journey to reduce deforestation to discuss about these issues. Among the topics include Indonesia's success to get funding for efforts in re reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation, or also known as RED. I'm Adisti, uh, a managing editor at the Jakarta Post, will be your host today. Before we begin, I'd like to share the rules of this webinar. First, the webinar will be held in English. Uh, second, we will have a keynote speech and uh, two speakers today. Uh, 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 Ibu Belinda uh, Margono, the Director of Forest Resources Inventory and Monitoring of the Environment and Forestry Ministry, will present the keynote speech on behalf of the uh, Deputy Environment and Forestry Minister uh, Bapak Alwe Dohong because he has an emergency meeting. And also uh, Ibu Belinda will also uh, elaborate about the declining trend of deforestation and the key policies that the Forestry Ministry has, has done to, uh, to get into this, uh, to, to get this success. Uh, and afterwards, uh, we'll hear from Mr. Eric Solheim, former UN Environment Executive Director and former Norwegian Minister of Environment and International Development, who were among the key people that sealed the deal for one billion US dollar pledge to help Indonesia reduce deforestation. We will also hear from Food and Agriculture Organization representative at, in, at interim, Mr. Richard Trencher who will highlight about remaining challenges in deforestation and forest fires and how to make the declining tr uh, trend of deforestation sustainable in the future. Okay, without further ado, okay, uh, before we begin, uh, yes, there will be, uh, and also one more thing, there will be, uh, of course, the, the, the third and final part of this webinar, we will have a discussion and Q&A session uh, if you have some questions uh, during the sessions to any speakers, don't hesitate to share it with us. Use the Q&A feature on your Zoom applications, and then we will pick some of the questions to be discussed together after uh, the sessions. Without further ado, let us begin this webinar by hearing the keynote speech and presentation from Ibu Belinda Margono. Ibu Belinda, the floor is yours. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen and the participants. So first of all, I would like to start with the keynote speech on behalf of Mr. Aludohong, the Vice Minister of Environment and Forestry, Republic of uh, Indonesia. Uh, uh, the keynote speech will be delivered on the Jakarta Post webinar with the title Declining Rate of Deforestation is it the new normal? Uh, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, it is actually a great honor for me to deliver on behalf of the Minister of Environment and Forestry of the Republic of Indonesia. A keynote speech at this very important forum. I feel so proud standing before the participant today, uh, delivering a speech addressing the critical title a declining rate of deforestation, is it a new normal? We understand that this declining rate of Indonesia deforestation make a historic record, uh, showing that in uh, reducing deforestation. Thus, first I would like to congratu uh, congratulate all members of the Ministry of Environment and Forestry for their hardworking and dedicated action. Second, I also would like to express my gratitude to all stakeholders in the forestry sector, 
for their commitment and support to the government policies and technical and technical guidance. We also express our appreciation to all stakeholders, especially in the forestry-based sector, for implementing sustainable forest use. Lastly, I would like to thank the Jakarta Post for initiating this strategic discussion. Uh, further, we realize that the deforestation in Indonesia is an issue that always stimulates high attention from the national and international forum. The Indonesia forestry history has shown the record that deforestation in the 90s to 2000 period was the highest level of deforestation that has ever occurred in Indonesia. Ever since, Indonesia has attempted to improve forest governance through enacting and implementing various policies and program to manage and utilize forests in a sustainable manner. Those efforts uh, re uh, reached the peak last year when it then be, uh, become the pride for the government as well as the people of Indonesia that we achieve a very significant reduction in deforestation. Forest Monitoring System, or uh, Indonesian name is Simontana, System Monitoring Hutan National Data, show that the Indonesia deforestation for the year to, uh, 2019 to 2020 period uh, cover uh, 0.115 million hectare, or about uh, 115,000 uh, hectare which was the lowest rate of deforestation on any count. Uh, with participants, uh, today we are living in the COVID-19 pandemic era. In this kind of the pandemic situation, everything is changing and we are adapting to the new normal situation. In the midst of a global disaster situation, the government is trying hard to maintain economic growth by means of introducing several strategic policies and economic stimulus measures. The agriculture sector with its derivative commodities is one of the leading contributor in generating foreign exchange for the country. Arguably, the sector is often blamed for causing deforestation in Indonesia. However, in fact, the agriculture sector remains one of the national economy's leading player in the midst of a pandemic in Indonesia. Surprisingly, the success of the agriculture sector in surviving in pandemic era was not followed by an increase in the deforestation rate. In contrast, the deforestation rate continued to decline, particularly for 2019 to 2020. We believe many factors have contributed to the success, including policies and technical guidance served by the Ministry of Environment and Forestry. We have no deforestation rate prior to the year of 2000 become the lesson learned for us to improve how to managing and to sustaining the forest resources. Fundamentally, we have uh, we have issued range and fine, civil and administrative regulatory arrangement. The, ultimate, uh, the culmination of the strategy is commenced with uh, the issue of law number 18 of 2013 on prevention and eradication of forest damage. Subsequently, we also issued various policies, including land and forest rehabilitation, moratorium of granting new business license on primary forest and the peatland. Uh, the policy then reaffirmed with the permanently uh, termination of granting new business license. So it is not called moratorium anymore, uh, anymore. And also another one, moratorium and evaluation of granting license of palm oil estate, especially on state forest area. So those three are very important. 
We understood that deforestation also arose on land tenure conflict within state forest area. We are commencing numerous policies, including social forestry, resolution for state forest area occupation, or Indonesian language is penyelesaian penguasaan tanah dalam kawasan hutan atau PPTKH, and also the land parcel as an object of the land reform program. In Indonesian, is tanah objek reforma agraria atau TORA. We comprehend that we also have to arrange international engagement to obtain global support. We have we have take, uh, taken part in miscellaneous bilateral or multilateral instrument, including the Forest Law Enforcement Governance and Trade or FLECT, and National Determined Contribution (NDC). Those aforementioned attempt all together lead to the re uh, reduction of deforestation to date. Additionally, the national approach to reduce the land and forest fire scale by prioritizing to the prevention approach rather than suppression measure, as well as with active engagement from various stakeholders, also contribute to the re uh, reduction deforestation rate in the country. The lowest record of the Indonesian deforestation rate will not end our endeavor to achieve sustainable management of forests. That will become the beginning of the next sustainability and green journey. We believe that the development of various economic sector is possible to manage alongside with environmental sustainability to reach the green economy. We have comments the various SIM under social forestry program. We ascertain that concept of the SFM, SMF is possible to conduct in the state forest area exterior by empowering the people. They can cultivate timber estate or non-timber forest products such as fruit tree at their own land or some area with specific, uh, special management right. This movement will give people to elevate their income and economy as well as quality of life without encroach uh, the forest. On the other hand, by growing the tree, will be improved. Hydrological cycle will be maintained and the nearby community will be enjoy the change. But we aware that our aim can only be achieved with strong support from whole communities, local leader, and other stakeholders. Nevertheless, <clears throat> various challenges and obstacles remain in the midst of effort to maintain forest area sustainably, while at the same time reducing the rate of deforestation. Hence, innovative policies and approaches to solve such challenges need to be put in place and implemented. Furthermore, reducing the deforestation rate and keeping, uh, keep, keeping it level remain low may not be able to be handled or administered by the Ministry of Environment and Forestry independently. Hence, active support and positive contribution in many ways are significantly needed so as to keep the deforestation rate remain low. In addition, managing forests in a sustainable way needs serious participation, active role and collaboration from stakeholders, and thus uh, Indonesian government, particularly the Ministry of Environment and Forestry, will appreciate any kind of support, role, and assistance in keeping our forest area sustainably. In closing my speech, it's, uh, and despite many policies, effort and action have been implemented for achieving sustainable forest management practice in Indonesia. However, the Ministry of Environment and Forestry sees further improvement is still needed. Hence, we welcome any constructive suggestion, recommendation, ideas, or even critique so as to improve our current policies, approaches, and actions in managing our forest resource sustainability. I believe without active participation and close collaboration with stakeholders, 
uh, the goal to keeping and managing our forest sustainably and hence reducing deforestation will be somewhat difficult. We have to bear in mind that managing our forests in sustainable and wise ways are not only for the sake of present, but also for future gener uh, generation prosperity. So, <clears throat> by the grace of the God, the Almighty, I uh, officially open the Jakarta Post webinar on declining rate of deforestation. Is it the new normal today? I wish you all a very fruitful and successful webinar. Thank you very much for your kind attention. On behalf of the Vice Minister of Ministry of Environment and Forestry, Mr. Aludohong. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Ibu Belinda. So, uh, yeah, since uh, Pak Rwanda can also join join us this afternoon, so Ibu Belinda, uh, could you will you kindly uh, directly uh, share the presentation material uh, also about the declining rate of deforestation? Okay, thank you. Yes, but this, thank you. So this thank you. this will be more technical. So let me start sharing the screen. Okay, the full screen. Okay. Declining rate of deforestation of Indonesia. Uh, declining rate of Indonesia deforestation. I will start this presentation uh, because this is more technical, but maybe giving uh, an information about how Indonesia can uh, measure the deforestation for the country. I would like to start with the definition we use because usually uh, definition is always uh, an issue on debate, but I would like to clearly mention what the definition used here. What we mean with forest is actually the natural forest and plantation forest. So in this situation, we put both uh, the natural and the man-made forest. And we use the terminology of brutal deforestation, which is defined as the conversion of forest cover to non-forest cover area. And then on the other way, we use the term of reforestation which is defined as conversion of non-forest cover to forest cover area. Uh, originally, uh, the monitoring system that Indonesia has uh, consists of 23 uh, classes. But with uh, among those 23 classes, then we uh, group it into two main classes, which is forested and non-forest or forest cover and non-forest cover. So in uh, brutal deforestation, uh, we measure or we rec uh, record all the change from the class of forest cover to the class of non-forest cover. And the reforestation is in the other way around. And what we call it the deforestation that usually you guys uh, recognize from our publication is actually the net deforestation, which is actually the brutal deforestation. So all the change from the forest cover to non-forest cover uh, minus the reforestation that actually we can uh, uh, measure from the remote sensing data. So this is actually the definition we use. So simply, as I mentioned, we have 23 classes. Uh, as you can see, this is 23 classes. The light green is actually all the natural forests. We have six classes of natural uh, forests, which is actually divided into three types, the dryland, the mangrove, and the swamp forest. 
and this uh, and another one uh, forest class is actually the plantation or the man-made. So there are seven of the uh, forest classes, and then the rest from class number eight up to uh, twenty-three. Uh, 22 actually because the 23 actually is no data is the non-forest area the non-forest so here if we use uh, the deforestation is actually from the forest uh, the bruto from forest to non-forest and also the deforestation and actually we use uh, we also try to measure only on the natural forest and both natural forest and the plantation forest so at the idea uh, why we have the 23 classes because we want to uh, to be able to measure everything uh, so with this 23 classes we can measure everything but later uh, following the reporting process we can regroup it whether we want to report all uh, the chains only for the natural forest or we include all the chains both the prime uh, the natural the plantation uh, independently or also adding with the reforestation so that is the idea why we have all these classes and why we uh, have uh, several information related to deforestation including the brutal deforestation, the netto deforestation, and so on. And the information is actually online. Uh, you can use this link before, it's mentioned here, that uh, you can use it to see all the data and information uh, I mentioned about here. So simply that our national monitoring system actually consists of two parts. The first is about the land monitoring, and the second is about the field monitoring. The land monitoring is including the land cover map, the land cover change map, and also the burn scar map. So within the last maybe 10 years, we improve uh, a lot of the information, including the change map and the burn scar. Those uh, improve, uh, improvement are including uh, improve the quality and so on. And the other part, of the monitoring system is about the feed data measurement. The feed data measurement actually uh, end up with uh, providing information about biomass. And then later on, we can uh, convert into emission factor. And this is actually the system, uh, the process, the flow of the process, how the uh, monitoring system has conduct. So the blue, uh, there are several color on this flow because each color actually uh, represent a different uh, part of the task and also the organization. The blue one, uh, the in, uh, preparation and so on, is actually from the LAPAN. LAPAN is actually uh, the institution like NASA, but is in Indonesia. So they provide they provide the satellite imagery they do the pre-processing and make all the data ready for next step for the interpretation. Uh, the most hiking and so on is uh, done by LAPAN uh, in, um, and they provide the information for next step like the interpretation. For the interpretation, uh, there are two parts, I would say two parts that actually included is in the office in Jakarta is actually for quality control and also the regional office uh, in there are 22 regional office for the whole country that actually work for uh, visual interpretation. So here the all the work done by the uh, original uh, uh, regional offices and then the quality control done by the office in uh, Jakarta. And then next uh, Color is actually the PIG. PIG is actually is the institution that maintain for uh, on and managing the spatial information. <clears throat> so they provide all the information related to the uh, base map and so on, uh, just to, main, uh, to make sure that all the information we have for land cover is really matched match with the base map. 
And again, later on, after we have done with all the data, there is also a step of dissemination. Dissemination is also done by our office, uh, by different uh, unit, a different uh, subdirectorate that actually provide for uh, geodatabase and web GIS and also the map service. This is actually the process we have so far. I will say that we have uh, worked through six periods to have the system. Uh, the period one is actually around the 90s. Uh, that was the area when we actually still work with, uh, I would say, the prototype. So why, how we develop the method, how we understand uh, the data, how we know the information from the field was uh, a prototype, prototype during the period one. And then the period two is actually from year 2000 to 2009. And then is, that is the year when we start to have the system, the monitoring system. Uh, during that year, actually Landsat, that actually our main data set was not free. So we have to buy and it's quite expensive. That's the reason why we only have the system every three years. Because the first years is actually we use uh, to select the data uh, because Indonesia is actually uh, for the Landsat scene, we have 218 scene for the, uh, the whole country. So the first year we have to select uh, the area coverage. Then the second year we have to do uh, the process to get the data, including buying and so on. And then the third year is the uh, step for uh, uh, processing, uh, visual interpretation and so on. So that is the reason why we have three years in the past. But after uh, the regulation of Landsat change, when the data is becoming free, so start in year 2009, or I would say end of 2009, and we have a uh, two year uh, for conversion. Start in 2011, we have all the data uh, free so we can have uh, make a system annually or yearly. That is start in period three. And then the period four, uh, we start also to improve the information with the use of uh, high resolution, the mosaic of spot. Uh, six and uh, seven. So within the area of forest, the Kawasan Hutan, we also use uh, the high resolution uh, to improve the quality of the information. And then in a period five, period five, we start to have uh, the information of the land fire, including the burn scar area. We have uh, also yearly but in the period six, we have uh, the fire, not only yearly, but actually for monitoring, we also have a monthly, and we improve the quality of all the data with the accuracy assessment. So this is also to prove uh, to the global community that the data is, is not just data, but we also uh, provide all the information regarding the quality control and so on. This is actually the result, if you can see from the year 90. Yes, you can see that the forest is uh, shrinking, but becoming uh, 90. So more of the change is between 90 to 2000, most of the change. And then we reduce and yeah, we can see that very little change that can be detected. And we also provide all this information of the change in the book that name uh, recalculasi, the forest resource recalculation. So based on forest resource monitoring of year 2020, uh, 2020 uh, we show that forest cover area is about 95.6 million hectare or about 50.9% from the land, uh, uh, total land of Indonesia. 25.5% from forest uh, cover area or 88.4 million hectare is located in forest area. 
meaning inside of the kawasan hutan. This information is actually also available online that you can use, uh, you can uh, download it from the uh, Ministry of Environment and Forestry uh, website. And this is actually the deforestation from year to year. Uh, and if we combine with the, the period that I explained before, you can see that uh, the quality of the data is also improved. But before 2000, we can see that the deforestation is really high and then reduce until last year, we reached the, the lowest uh, deforestation we have. In the last uh, few periods, deforestation in Indonesia is uh, clearly declined. But this graph is showed by the net deforestation on the period 2019 to 2020. It's declined about 75% uh, from the previous one. Land and forest fire on 2020 are about 296,000 hectares, but give no impact to deforestation rate. Only about 1.1 thousand hectare or 0.4% of deforestation that driven by forest fire. So this is about the, some policy that I would say. Forest governance policy instrument for declining deforestation. I cannot see the title when I, I show and, and, and the full uh, print. So some of the governance here I mentioned with the first Indonesian name is PIPIP. It was named moratorium, but uh, we call it now uh, suspended new permit on primary natural forest and peatland. So this is actually based on the presidential instruction number 10, uh, year 2011, but uh, replaced by interest number five, 2019. That is when from moratorium become uh, like the suspend of the new permit. And then the second one is the release of forest area only in non-forest cover. That is the government law, uh, 104, 2015. And then the protection of the pit ecosystem, uh, that is the government regulation 71, 2014, replaced by uh, government regulation 57, uh, 2016. And then the other one is oil palm moratorium policy that is in press 8, 2018. So that those two actually are different. There are two in press, in press 5, 2019 and in press 8, 2018, those two are different. The 2018 in press is actually to stop the new oil palm concession and evaluation the existing of oil palm concession. Next is the land and forest fire program uh, that combine many approaches. And then the next is forest resource monitoring system using the remote sensing technology that based on planning and controlling system. And next is about community-based land general conflict resolution. That is the area for TORA and social forestry. And another one is strengthening of strategic environment assessment program or KLHS and then program for law enforcement using approach of civil law, criminal law, and administrative law. The last one is actually the one that you can see more in the uh, PP government law 23 about the forestry, the new one. With this, I would like to uh, uh, conclude and finish my presentation. I hope if you have any question, if you want to have further explanation, we can have a discussion later. Thank you very much. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ibu Belinda. Uh, it's a very enlightening uh, presentation. So we know that not only that there are more a comprehensive and focused policy to reduce deforestation, but there has been also a major leap in uh, technology. Uh, so there has been uh, much, much better uh, technology used in remote sensing to deliver better data and information on uh, forest, uh, forest cover uh, during uh, the past uh, 
10 to 20 years. And this is, this is, this is a very, very good progress for Indonesia. Okay, uh, I'm sure you already have a lot of questions for Ibu Melinda, uh, but hold on uh, because we will need to hear from our second speaker. Uh, Mr. Solheim, uh, Pak Erik. Uh, Pak Erik is a renowned uh, global leader and expert in environment and development. He served as Norwegian Minister of Environment and International Development uh, from 2005 to 2012, in which he initiated the global program for conservation uh, of rainforests, including the, pro the RED project in Indonesia. Today, he will share with us about his experience and insights about Red Project Indonesia. Uh, Pak Erik, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Ivo. Uh, this is really an exciting webinar, and I'm so happy today. This is really a day for celebrations and congratulations. I'm addressing you from Delhi, India, and I couldn't be more happy than attending this webinar. Because what Indonesia has done now being a lead nation in reducing deforestation. Uh, the decline in deforestation in Indonesia is the fastest in the world, and it's such a success story. So we should celebrate and say thank you to the people of Indonesia who's pulled off this, to the government of Indonesia, and to the business of Indonesia, because uh, together uh, you have done this. And of course, what's most important is that you have avoided uh, the choice between development and environment. Because in the past, people said, do you want to develop or do you want to take care of Mother Earth? There is no so, such choice any longer. We can have rapid, fast development, bringing people out of poverty, but at the same time, taking care of forests and taking care uh, of the uh, environment. And of course, the renewable economy where we can shift from coal into solar and wind is another example of that. Uh, it's eco economy and ecology. Thank you to both. And that's why it's so encouraging that Indonesia has been able to reduce the deforestation while at the same time having increased production from agriculture, being able to feed its people even, uh, even better. So this is a victory for Indonesia, and it's a victory for everyone else, for the world. But I believe that the Indonesian people is too modest. It's not in your DNA to brag about what you achieve. Uh, the Europeans and the Americans are better at boasting or bragging, telling people how great we are. And the Indonesians are so, in, uh, so modest, we don't tell, uh, the, tell this to the world. Um, Time has now come for Indonesia to tell the success story of deforestation in Indonesia so that other people can be inspired. Because this success story, of course, can be replicated in Africa, in Latin America, in Europe, and so many other places. And frankly, it also fits into a wider success story of Indonesia. We tend to forget to go back to the time of the great crisis in Indonesia and in, in the 1960s, uh, the life expectancy in Indonesia was in the low 40s. When you were born in Jakarta or Medan or wherever, uh, you can, or Solo Jakarta, you could expect to be uh, for about 40 years old. Now life expectancy in Indonesia is well above 70, an enormous progress. And when I first uh, visited uh, Indonesia in the late 1990s, uh, the years right after the fall of the Suharto government, uh, most people, most experts, most doomsayers all over the planet, they said, oh, oh Indonesia will fall apart. Uh, at the time, there were caused wars in East Timor, in Aceh, uh, in the Moluks, uh, there were riots in Sulawesi. There were problems all over the land and people said this, this will not work out. Well, you proved them wrong. Indonesia has become a vast democracy, a strong state, rapid economic development, bringing millions and tens of millions out of poverty while taking care of the environment at the same time. So the success story of Indonesia, the fourth largest nation on earth population wise should be told uh, to the world and I'm happy if I can play a small part 
in that. I was a Norwegian Minister of Environment. I'm very, very proud of what we did in 2010 uh, when Norway made a small contribution to the success of Indonesia. Uh, the main success is with the people of Indonesia and the government of Indonesia. Let me come back to that. But in 2010, then President SPY he came to Norway. Uh, uh, then uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Pak Marti, and myself, we signed uh, the letter of intent between Indonesia and Norway, providing for Norwegian support of 1 billion US dollars to Indonesia on the basis of proven results in reduced deforestation. Uh, it was a very moving moment. Uh, SPY, the president, even wrote a poem on his way back with the, his aircraft called Oslo about emotions for this and the prospects for the future generations of Indonesians in uh, containing deforestation and protecting the beauty of the, of the rainforest. What we did was a result-based arrangement uh, where the support from Norway to Indonesia would not become on the basis of intentions, which we knew were good, but on the basis of results. And I think that was critical. In the midst of the process, uh, then Prime Minister of Norway, Jens Stoltenberg, uh, he called me and said, maybe this is, maybe you should not do this. Maybe it's too difficult. Maybe Indonesia will not deliver. I told him, no, let's trust Indonesia. It's a great nation. They have a great foreign minister, Mr. Marti, a great president, SPY, a great environment minister, Pakuntura at the time, and are dedicated to achieve this. And by the way, Norwegian support will come on the basis of results. Uh, so if Indonesia is not delivering, uh, we will not pay. Now Indonesia is delivering, and Norway for sure will pay. And even if we have a new government in Norway at the time, this government will honor the commitments we made. And there is broad support in the Norwegian parliament uh, for honoring uh, the agreement. And the result based scheme was also critical because when some people came up with criticisms, uh, we could tell them this is not about exact policies of any nation, it's about results. If the results are delivered, uh, we will pay. At the time, Norway made this agreement with Brazil and Indonesia as the two biggest rainforest nations in the world. We also added Guyana a small uh, Latin American nation for the reason that Guyana has the most intact rainforest in the world. 99% uh, of the rainforest in Guyana is intact and it's not right to punish a nation for the success. So we uh, gave also support to Guyana. Later, Norway has also supported the Congo, Congos, Colombia, Latin America and other nations. But the partnerships with Brazil and with Indonesia were at the core of this agreement, and I'm very proud to say it worked out. Then Jakarta Post is asking, is this the new normal? Why did it work out? And I believe it worked out for three reasons. Uh, the policies of the government of Indonesia, the change in business in Indonesia, uh, and the support from the citizens uh, of Indonesia. Let me start, start with the government. When SPY uh, government started this, then the COVID government came in and some people said, no, 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 there, there will be a change and the will not deliver. Then Ibu City came in as the Minister of Forestry and, and, and Environment and some people were skeptical. I told them, why are you so skeptical? Let's give them a chance, let them see if they deliver. And Ibu City with a background from the Minister of Forestry has proven to be the most dedicated hardworking, systematic, decisive environment minister, I would say anywhere in the world. Uh, if all the, all the ministers of environment in the world were like Gibe City, uh, we would be in a much better place. So her leadership and the leadership of President Yokovi and the government of Indonesia is the main reason why Indonesia is now uh, such a success. Without government leadership, you will always fail. With government leadership, uh, any nation can be uh, successful. And the uh, government, of course, implemented uh, first a logging moratorium, then a palm oil moratorium, then a, a peatland moratorium, and put in place all the legislation to make this work. The legislation of Indonesia is no so good 
that even the strongest critic in civil society cannot really point to anything which is wrong. And that pays tribute to the government of Indonesia, but for sure also to the parliament, because without broad support in the parliament, no government can work it out. So this is the number one reason why it has worked out so far. And this is the number one reason why we are with the new normal and why it will work in the future. We have the government need leadership, which is needed. Secondly, I've seen a sea change in business. True, business was once a problem. And uh, the big companies of Indonesia and Southeast Asia, some of them registered in Singapore and other places, but the big companies of Indonesia were part of the problem. They were the main drivers uh, uh, of the logging and the palm oil and the destruction of the forest. But also the business leadership changed. They understood that they can make the same profit make the shareholders happy, create new jobs, improve and better more jobs, simply by using the land, which is already at hand, which is already deforested. So there is no need to bring in new land. Indeed, Indonesia still have substantial amount of already deforested land, which can be used for economic purposes. So there is no need to go into the forest. So at, in the same way as government took the lead, business also started to change. By the way, we see this business all over the world. It's not just in Indonesia, but there is a complete change uh, in the business attitude. Uh, and without business, we will come nowhere. Let me give you one example. I'm advising April, on a, which is the biggest palm and um, uh, biggest paper and pulp company in the world, and also a big palm oil company. In, in, in Sumatra, they have what they call the one-to-one -one conservation scheme which is that for every square meter of uh, uh, plantation, which uh, April is using, they will conserve one square meter uh, of virgin rainforest. And they have a huge rainforest in Sumatra and the Riau province, which is protected uh, by April. They bring in the helicopters if needed, the fire brigades if someone is trying to encroach upon the, the forest, if there is any harm to the forest, uh, they, it's stopped by the means of the, of the companies. And these big companies, like it or not, they often have more resources even than government, and for sure not a lot more resources than civil society groups. So we need to bring on board uh, the big business for this, and that, that's what's happening. So when government and business are leading, we will get there. Let me add that you also need the support from citizens and non-governmental actors. Because, of course, government needs support from citizens. Those are the voters. If voters are voting for green political leaders, they will get it. And the citizens are also the customers of the companies. And the companies cannot do without customers. But when we have these three forces moving in tandem, government, business, and citizens, then they are achieving the great, great results, which we are now seeing in uh, in the Indo, uh, and Asia. Let me say uh, that finally that this is happening at a very, very auspicious time for environment in the world. Because it's not just Indonesia where we see huge environment progress. President Xi Jinping of China just recently announced that China will go carbon neutral uh, by 2060. And there's an enormous green surge in, in China now. China's half of all solar energy in the world. Uh, it's the biggest wind, for, uh, wind farm nation in the world. Uh, they have 70% of all high-speed rail in the world, by the way. China is also financing the uh, Jakarta, Bandung high-speed rail in Indonesia. So you see China going green at an unprecedented speed. Exactly at the same time, President Joe Biden of the United States has launched his new infrastructure program. It's two point trillion uh, US dollars, 2,300 billion American dollars. And it will go into charging stations for electrical vehicles, upgrading of the, uh, of the um, uh, water, water system for, for poor people's in the United, people in the United States, into solar energy, into wind farms. Uh, it will simply make America green in a way we have never seen in the past. In Europe, we have the European New Green Deal, 
which is the by far most ambitious uh, uh, environment program ever happening in Europe and in the nation where I'm now sitting in India, Prime Minister Modi is launching new solar schemes basically by the day. Uh, India now has the three out of the five biggest solar farms in the world. And India has the first all solar rail station in the world, all first all solar uh, airport in the world. And the uh, metro here in New Delhi uh, will soon be, be, um, be powered uh, by, by, by solar power. And then you add up all this, the fantastic green surge in all the major economic powers of the world, China, the United States, the Europe, and India, with the fourth biggest nation in the world, Indonesia, uh, curbing the deforestation, is really a time uh, for global uh, optimism. We all know why it's so important to protect the forest. It's about the biodiversity, protecting Mother Earth, making sure that future generations can uh, orangutans can, can live, the mountain, uh, the, the forest man. It's about the livelihood of people living in the forest, and it's about curbing this disaster for humanity called, uh, called climate change. But this is a day of optimism. I pay tribute to the government of Indonesia and the people of Indonesia for pulling off this miracle, this enormous positive uh, green development. And I'm certain this will be the new normal because I know the government is dedicated and the people is dedicated. And when you see this dedication from business people and uh, government, there is no force in the world which can stop it. But let's combine, bring the good, exciting news to Indonesia, from Indonesia to the rest of the world to inspire other people. And my Indonesian friends, don't be modest. Please go out and tell this success story to the world. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Pyrek. Uh, very interesting. Uh, uh, very, very interesting points that we learned from uh, Pyrek. Uh, uh, how in the in the beginning there are, there was a lot of doubts uh, to Indonesian government whether uh, Indonesia can deliver uh, in in the Norway deal. But then over time, uh, Indonesia has proven uh, that it can be held accountable in, in, uh, in its uh, red projects. And finally, in 2000, uh, 2020, actually, uh, Norway is paying uh, $56 million uh, for, uh, for Indonesia's uh, success to reduce deforestation in 2000 in 2016 uh, to 2017. And uh, as I highlighted from uh, Pyrek, there are three uh, ingredients. Uh, first is the, a very committed government and uh, Pyrek uh, has uh, mentioned Busiti uh, as the most systematic uh, minister that finally can deliver the results-based mechanism that required in the Norway deal. And also there's the big change in business sector and this is actually something that we should uh, highlight more actually a uh, business leadership change and there is a growing uh, there's a growing uh, awareness that actually uh, we don't need to open new land actually to to make uh, to make uh, productive uh, productive activities uh, productive plantation uh, but it it can also we can also use the fast de deforested land and actually the growing awareness in business sector of course have a huge impact uh, in the forest forestry sector because uh, that's where all the resources is and actually that uh, actual business sector is the one that also moves the needle for in the forestry sector and citizens also yeah this is a very global movement right now. Uh, we've seen that uh, voters become more aware on green issues. Voters begin to vote for green political leaders, and voters begin to care about what they consume, about how they live, and they want to live sustainably. Uh, and I think that's also uh, another uh, game changers for uh, for uh, sustainability uh, in in the future. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Pyrek. Uh, now we can move 
into uh, our third speaker, uh, Mr. Trenchard. Mr. Trenchard uh, will, will give us uh, some highlights from uh, the, sta the, the 2020 State of Indonesia Forest, a document that gives comprehensive view to Indonesia's uh, the country's forests, which is uh, developed uh, with the uh, Forestry Ministry as well. And also, uh, Mr. Trencher will highlight uh, the challenges and provide us with some insights and projection about uh, how uh, Indonesia can 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 sustain this this positive positive uh, trend of declining uh, deforestation uh, in the future. Mr. Trencher, the floor is yours. Terima kasih, Salamat Siang. Good afternoon, distinguished panelists. Ibu Belinda, Eric, participants, colleagues, and forest partners. Um, Muff, but I too will speak in English with my terrible British accent, and we will share a copy of my statement with the Jakarta Post colleagues. Thank you for organizing today's event after the Zoominar in both English and in Bahasa Indonesian. The world's forests we know are under threat. More than 10 million hectares of forests are being converted to other land uses every single year around the world. This means an area of forest about half the size of Sulawesi is being converted, or as we often say in English, are being lost around the world every year. This is equivalent to a hectare of forest lost every three minutes or to put it in terms that we can perhaps all visualize more clearly a forest area the size of a soccer field has been lost or converted every two minutes think about that the next time you watch a game of soccer or drive past a game but as we know indonesia has enormous forest resources 120 million hectares of land are classified as forest, equivalent to about 3% of the world's total forest area, including 93 million hectares of tree cover. That's an area almost four times the size of my own country, the United Kingdom. This is why the recent and highly positive results with regard to deforestation in Indonesia are so important. What happens in Indonesia really matters. Protecting Indonesia's forests and ensuring that they are managed sustainably is vital for Indonesia's environment, for Indonesia's people and for Indonesia's economy. But let me say again, their importance extends far beyond this wonderful archipelago's almost endless shorelines. As the COP26 president Mr. Alok Sharma recently declared, Indonesia's forest resources make it a climate superpower when it comes to tackling the world's climate crisis, a climate superpower. Indonesia's continuing progress with regard to reducing deforestation, as we've heard, as we've seen, is highly positive. But also at the same time as has been acknowledged, the path ahead remains long, and the journey challenging. But let me say, as indeed Pak, um, Eric Solheim said as well, FAO applauds the excellent work being done by the Ministry of Environment and Forestry to lead these efforts, working closely with communities, the private sector, and non-governmental organizations. Measuring forest resources accurately, being transparent with the results, and putting in place robust policies, provisions and enforcement mechanisms, as well as engaging communities and the private sector effectively, are all key if forest resources are to be managed effectively and if deforestation is to be reduced. And once again, these are all areas in which Indonesia is making good progress and we're seeing the results. We must remember too, that the contribution of Indonesia's forests should not be measured in terms of the environment and climate change alone. Forestry contributes to what FAO calls the four betters, better production, better nutrition, 
better environment and a better life. So we at FAO work to support the Ministry of Environment and Forestry in a wide range of areas. And this collaboration extends back more than 40 years here in Indonesia. Our support draws upon our expertise here in Indonesia, and I'm really glad that Pak Adam, Ger Pak Adam Gerand is with me today here. He leads our forestry work here in Indonesia as a true global forest expert. But also, I should stress, we work really closely and continuously with colleagues in, uh, in Bangkok, our regional office, and also our headquarters in Rome, as well as with, our, with the global networks of which we're a part. So let me first turn now to the 2020 State of Indonesia's Forest Report. The report is an, ex an enormously significant report. It's absolutely timely. It's really well written, which is important. And for those of you who have not read it, I really encourage you to do so. It's important. The excellent report provides a showcase on the work that is going on in Indonesia. The report's seven chapters contain an enormous amount of up-to-date and often highly sophisticated data collected using an array of state-of-the-art tools and analytics. It provides a wealth of analysis and information on the current forest situation and what is being done, particularly but not only by government. It also signals a number of clear and important future directions. Much of the work highlighted in the 2020 report relates to work that is being done to build the solid data, the evidence and the policy foundations needed to manage forests sustainably and reduce deforestation. We heard from Ibu Belinda about much of this work earlier this afternoon. So let me once again take this opportunity to congratulate Minister Ibu Siti Nobaya, Paka Franja, the principal author, and all the other contributors for an excellent report that I'm sure and hope will be read widely in both Indonesia and around the world. And I'm pleased too that FAO was able to make a modest contribution to its preparation and finalization, and a point which is acknowledged several times in the report itself. The report underscores the commitment of President Joko Widodo and the government of Indonesia to the forest sector. The government's work to democratize the allocation of forest resources, to manage the nation's forests sustainably, to prevent deforestation and the degradation of forest resources, and to ensure environmental justice and equality of opportunity for all members of Indonesia's society, including customary law or ADAT communities. Much of the work that is highlighted throughout the report is both strong in terms of results and in many cases highly innovative, a point that Pak Eric made several times. This is why it's such an important read for both people here in Indonesia and the international community. The economic importance of the forest sector is clear. The fact that the Ministry of Environment and Forestry is directly involved in four of the seven development agenda of Indonesia's National Medium Term Development Plan, the RPJMN, for 20 to 20, 2020 to 2024, excuse me, underscores the sector's economic importance. And as in all countries, we at FAO continually str stress the absolute importance of putting sustainable tinder, timber harvesting at the centre of export strategies, which FAO supports Indonesia through the Forest Law Enforcement, Governance and Trade Project, the FLEG T project, ensuring that timber exports and the jobs they create are built on forest regeneration and sustainable forest management rather than illegal logging and excessive deforestation. And once again, we welcome the steps that the Ministry is taking in this regard and also the work of the Association of Indonesia Forest Concession Holders, the APHI, to drive sustainable forest production, management and harvesting at scale. The 2020 report also highlights many of the important challenges remaining. Whilst deforestation levels have fallen by almost 90% since the highs at the start of this century, when we saw more than three and a half million hectares of forest being lost a year, and last year's results are particularly encouraging, we all know there is still more to be done to ensure that these declines continue, that they are sustainable, and that they are part of a national development strategy that really does leave no one behind. Indonesia's use 
and deployment of powerful and often innovative tools for monitoring its forestry resources is highlighted multiple times in the report. For example, the development and rollout of Simontana, the National Forest Monitoring System, does not just deliver a powerful and innovative monitoring system, but it also contributes directly to the monitoring, reporting and verification system, the MRV, for climate change adaptation and mitigation. We at FAO are very excited that our work with the Ministry to help develop an improved national forest inventory and forest monitoring system as part of our broader support to strengthen Indonesian forest and land monitoring for climate actions is soon to begin, a programme that is made possible by the generous support of the Government of Norway. So smart policies, strong enforcement, robust evidence and innovative science and technology have been critical to Indonesia's progress in the forest sector and will remain critical. Effective enforcement is key. The Ministry recently reported that more than 1,000 forestry and environmental crimes have been successfully prosecuted, showing on the one hand that risks still remain, and we all know they do, but also underlying the importance of robust enforcement of laws and rules. These efforts to combat illegal logging, to protect the right of communities, and to ensure that forests are managed sustainably remain a continuing future priority and challenge. And also to ensure that what was previously called the moratorium continues to be enforced effectively in all parts of the country. Other highlights in the report include the excellent initiative to restore over 600,000 hectares of severely degraded mangrove forest by 2024. Excellent, critical. And there are, of course, many other highlights in the report, including the intensified commitment to resolve land tenure conflicts related to forest land and the, um, and the government's ongoing efforts to address climate change mitigation adaptation through its nationally determined contribution, its NDC, to reduce greenhouse emissions. But challenges remain. By 20, sorry, by 2100, how do we say that? 20, 2100. Climate change, so in, in, in 80 years, climate change is expected to result in up to a 7% drop in Indonesia's GDP. But we see that 38% of the country's NDC contributions to the Paris Agreement remain underfunded, not unfunded, but underfunded. It has been estimated that Indonesia requires around 20 billion US dollars a year to implement climate action by 2030. If these funding gaps are not addressed, there are very real risks that Indonesians will experience the net direct negative impacts from climate change, not just at the end of the century, but far sooner. These negative impacts will directly harm Indonesia's most vulnerable populations including customary law adapt communities and women. Market failures and the lack of enabling environment are impeding public and private investment at scale. And that's what we need. Public investment, private investment at scale. But we know that too that exciting and new innovative programs are emerging. And let me just cite one recently approved one by the United Nations Multi-Donor Joint Sustainable Development Goals Fund, the SDG Fund, recently approved a program called Driving Public and Private Capital Towards Green and Social Investments in Indonesia. It's a great example. The program, and I should add that FAO is not involved in this, the program will create a new generation of financial products to combat climate change at scale by helping the government to transition the country towards low impact energy, protecting the environment, and empowering the creation of women-led small businesses and a new generation of impact-driven enterprises. The program will bring to scale, it is hoped, proven and new financing instruments such as thematic bonds and impact funds and SDG-linked loans and develop the capacities of critical stakeholders. These types of approaches will be absolutely key going forward. So yes, challenges remain, but none of them are insurmountable. There are concerns that deforestation could and might rebound, return again. 
Fires are a big cause of deforestation, and we all know they are very hard to predict. So therefore, we welcome the attention given to forest fires in the 2020 report, which still remain an enormous problem. But also, and let me stress, we really applaud the efforts that have been used to combat them, including increased community involvement in fire prevention and response. The Indonesian BMKG, the weather agency, has recently said that 2020 was a wet year. In fact, 2020-2021 rainy season in Indonesia has, be has become the fifth wettest in 40 years, associated by many with the El Nino phenomena. The wet weather not only reduces fires getting started and helps put them out, but also limits their spread. And it also reduces a lot of the other deforestation activities, including large and small scale agricultural clearing. So we hope that the Ministry of Environment and Forestry is able to continue getting good results when the weather dries out in future years, as it, as it surely will. We will have El, uh, El Nino years as we'll have La Nina years as well. So overall, as I finish, Indonesia's reduced deforestation rate is encouraging, really encouraging, and especially the increasing efforts being taken by the government on transparency. Documents like this are really important when it comes to transparency. We know it's important. However, many people still consider that the deforestation rate is still too high, and this is causing high biodiversity rates, uh, losses. So are these declines in deforestation here to stay? The key is the strength, as Pak Eric Solheim said, is the strength of continuing government commitment, which we know here is really strong from the very, very top, and compliance by others. Yes, government efforts have been key in reducing deforestation, including the permanent ban on issuing new permits to clear primary forests and peatlands, the moratorium on new oil palm plantation licenses, which it will, Melinda referred to, forest fire mitigation, social forestry, land rehabilitation, and increased enforcement against environmental violations. And these programs have been backed up by solid evidence and data transparent use of this data, strong enforcement, and an ever stronger collaboration between government, communities, and the private sector. But as I've said, we know that it's highly likely that external factors have also helped these positive trends, particularly last year, including higher than normal rainfall and the economic slowdown caused by COVID-19. So yes, these declines can be sustained, but they require continuous effort, monitoring, commitment and enforcement, effort, monitoring, commitment and enforcement to ensure that Indonesia's forests are managed sustainably, that people whose livelihoods depend on them are not left behind, and that Indonesia's full contribution to addressing climate change and sustainable development are realised. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Shranchard. Uh, yes, uh, yeah, the 2020 State of Indonesian Forest is a very valuable document and it's available online. You can go check on the FAO website uh, to download. Uh, and from, uh, we can, we can it's, it's very encouraging to hear from uh, Mr. Trenchard that actually, uh, there's a there's a high chance that uh, this trend can be sustained in the long term because we already have the policies we already have the transparent da data we already have the commitment from the government the strong commitment from the government that will make uh, this challenges will be overcome and uh not, but uh, yeah, also there's a emphasis uh, on enforcement of laws and regulations. That's um, very critical. I agree with Mr. Trenchard because uh, none of the policies will be well implemented if there's no strong uh, enforcement of laws and regulations. And we have seen it coming from the government and we need to see it uh, to be consistent and then to be sustained in, in the long term so that uh, every stakeholder can uh, can know uh, can 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 uh, can know their position can can know can respect the regulations uh, and then 
of course, when when everyone respect the regulations, uh, uh, the resources will be sustainable in the long term. Okay. Uh, now I think uh, we can move on to Q and A session, uh, our discussion session, and we can go to our first uh, question. First question is from uh, Fikal Sablok uh, for Ibu Belinda. Uh, Ibu Belinda, uh, he's asking, uh, what are the metrics used by the Indonesian government to measure sustainable forest management within existing logging and plantation concessions? And how is the monitoring carried out? Please, Ibu Belinda. Thank you very much for the question. I probably would like to mention, uh, to highlight a bit that the monitoring system that I use here is actually the one that we use for the national. So that is not particularly or specifically for the uh, a company or uh, the one that we have for concession and so on. So we have all the national wide is including all uh, conservation area, the production area, and also the protection area. It's not specific, uh, specifically for uh, the concession. However, we try to uh, uh, identify the activity within uh, the concession by the uh, indication of, uh, for instance, uh, the road that actually exists within uh, the concession and also uh, several maybe uh, disturbance that can be recognized from the remote sensing uh, data. Uh, please also aware that actually the remote sensing data we use for the national wide is the Landsat uh, uh, data with the resolution uh, of 30 by 30 meter uh, resolution, spatial resolution. However, for specific use, for instance, for the Torah, we use also the spot six and uh, spot seven that they have a uh, better resolution. But for the national wide, we use uh, only the line set. That is uh, maybe the, the, the answer for the question right now. Okay, thank you, Ibu Belinda. Ibu Belinda, I would also like to uh, revisit your presentation. Uh, which one? Which, uh, which, uh, which uh, in which you said that there has been uh, progress in uh, remote sensing technology. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, in 2011, there's a huge leap where we go from buying the data to acquiring the, da the data by ourselves. If I'm not mistaken, yeah, yeah, yeah. can you can you uh, elaborate more on that? Uh, did we manage to get I don't know satellite satellite images or uh, how can we how can we get uh, how can how can we switch from from buying the data to really owning the data? Hold on. Okay, this one. Yes, yes. Uh, beginning in period three, if I'm not mistaken that we stop buying Landsat data to acquiring the data by ourselves. Yeah. Um, hold on. Okay, in principle, <clears throat> Hello, Bu Belinda? Yes. Yes, okay. Um. Yeah. Okay. In principle, uh, as I said that in the beginning, we use with buying the data, but since the data becoming free, so that's actually following the regulation by the NASA USGS, because in the end of 2009, uh, they decide to make the data uh, available free without any charge, so everybody can uh, download the data. So with this, uh, meaning that uh, usually we have to select the data because the, the, the data itself, the Landsat itself is quite expensive in the past. One scene is about uh, 
$700. So you can imagine how much money we have to spend if we have to uh, cover the entire country. Because for the country itself, we have to cover about 218 sin. If one sin is about $700, so you can imagine how much we have to uh, spend. But uh, since the policy of the NASA USGS changed, that is start in 2009, so all the data can be uh, downloaded free. Uh, so here we, uh, we have the collaboration with LAPAN, uh, the institution like the NASA, but in Indonesia, that actually they can get the data easily because they also maintain as the ground station, uh, the group of ground st uh, Landsat uh, ground station. So LAPAN can have all the data also free. And then uh, they also work with us and with many partners, actually with several university and also with several uh, project to really improve the quality and how uh, to combine uh, of providing the data, not uh, Landsat scene anymore, but it's already in a mosaic one. So this is not uh, an easy step <laughs> because it's a, uh, uh, we spent also a couple of years to really uh, end up with a methodology that actually accepted by many uh, parties, uh, not only by uh, government, but it's also with the uh, university. So scientifically, uh, the method can be accepted. That is the more important thing because uh, following the discussion, we also have to provide all this information, not only for us, but it also have to be uh, uh, fulfill the, requir the requirement of the MRV, the uh, measuring, reporting, and verification. With this way, meaning we have to explain the methodology we use and how we uh, maintain the data. So how we get the data, make it uh, becoming a mosaic and then we generated the information and then provide the accuracy assessment or the uh, information about the quality of the data is also the part to fulfill the requirement of the MRV because the MRV is a must. We cannot just leave it. And that is the, uh, the requirement that is all, not only the country requirement, but it is the global uh, requirement. So all the reviewer, for instance, if we talk about the under the Louis, uh, the one that I did I mentioned, uh, we will have also uh, the independent reviewer that actually want to see how we maintain the data, how we generated the information, and how the information will be provided. So the independent reviewer is not choose by Indonesia, it's choose by the UNFCCC, and so on. So they already have the so several uh, requirement on that, and they come or they communicate with us, uh, try to know all the detail, all the technical detail, all the scientific detail, and to approve or reject it if they can, uh, if they uh, uh, try to follow the process. So that is all uh, the, the situation that we have to uh, face uh, since the past up to now. So this is not. Not, not the easy step. So that's why we have like, I would, I would say to, we have like six step, six period to end up with the information we have uh, so far. Okay. Is that really answer the question? Or <laughs> maybe I missed something? <laughs> yes, yes. I think, I think it does. Uh, Ibu, uh, and also, uh, yeah. And this MRV is actually the requirement for international funding as well, right? from the UNFCCC yes. or the, the countries like Norway. It's a global yeah. uh, requirement for international yeah. funding, yeah, Bu, yeah? Yeah, that's okay. true. So that's why we spend a lot of our effort to, mm -hmm. uh, to really improve the quality of the data. You know, okay. because in the past, it, uh, maybe people just feel okay with when the data ready, but now it's not enough. If the data is there and how the quality of the data itself, how of the quality of the information that is required. That's why we spend a lot of our effort to really provide uh, the information and the accuracy of the data. Okay. And besides the USGS uh, that provides the data for free, uh, do, we, uh, do Indonesia also use other sources of data in its reporting? 
Oh yes, that's true. For 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 the time being, uh, it is true that our system is rely on the Landsat data so far, but it does not mean that we will not use another data because for our, uh, uh, in a way when we running the uh, system, we also use the Sentinel data. So any data, remote sensing data that actually can provide uh, the data with similar. Uh, similar uh, uh, category of the landsat. I mean, in in term of the band, in term of the uh, detailed information regarding the resolution and so on. So we can use for the time being. Uh, we use uh, landsat, but for the forest fire, we already combine the landsat with the sentinel data. Sentinel is from from the European from Europe. Satellite. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay, Bu. Okay, Ibu Belinda, thank you. Uh, our next question is from Karin Budi uh, for uh, Pak Eric. Uh, uh, she asks, uh, what is your thoughts on the Green New Deal and do you think it's possible to implement this in Indonesia? Go ahead, Pak Eric. Pak Eric, are you still there? Sorry. Uh... Yes. Green New Deal has basically been a concept in the United States uh, and in Europe. Uh, in the United States, it was um, an idea from some uh, radical parts of the Democratic Party with the environmentalist, and it has played, in my view, a key role uh, in the proposals which has been now put forward by Joe Biden as the new president of the United States. As I said earlier, his two point a three trillion package, which was just proposed to the American House of Representatives and Senate, is the greenest proposals at any point in the United States history. May have been uh, influenced by the Green New Deal, but it's not exactly, exactly the same. Uh, what um, Joe Biden has proposed is a, a huge investment scheme uh, in, uh, in the infrastructure. For instance, uh, establishing charging stations for renewable ve electric vehicles all over America, uh, supporting uh, in many different ways the American battery industry and car industry to go into, into, the, to into electric vehicles. Uh, he has proposed a, a huge scheme to clean up the water management system in, in the United States so that uh, those who do not get really clean uh, water, maybe it's polluted water from lead or in other, other ways, that they will not get that, they will now get clean water. Uh, it's a program for massive investment in solar energy and in wind energy. By the way, that's already happening in the US, but we'll go much, much faster with this, with this scheme. So this is a very, very green package. And I think it will be confirmed uh, by the House of Representatives and the Senate soon. In Europe, uh, Green New Deal has been adopted by the European Commission on behalf of the entire Europe. All European nations are behind this. Uh, and at the core is uh, uh, a scheme to make sure that the investments in Europe is going green. There is a kind of monitoring system for all kinds of finance, uh, where finance will be graduated, so that finance going into the true green sectors will get a premium. It will uh, be easier to finance and we can be the lower uh, in interest uh, interest rate and all businesses in Europe is kind of measured from uh, from this perspective. I'm very confident that uh, this Green New Deal in both in America and, and in uh, Europe will have major impact on these economies and of course the three biggest economies in the world is China, the United States and Europe. Uh, so this this is very very significant. I think Indonesia needs to develop its own policies. Uh, for sure, it can learn from Europe and the United States. Uh, Indonesia can also, by the way, learn from China and from India. Because there are so many good environment policies going on uh, at the moment. The most important of all is to make the shift from coal uh, into solar and wind and other renewable energies. Uh, the price of solar is now lower than the price of coal everywhere in the world. So it makes, makes sense, not just from the environment point of view, but from the economical point of view to move from, uh, from uh, coal 
into uh, solar uh, and wind. China uh, has 50% plus of all the solar industry in the world. India has the lowest price of solar anywhere in the world. So I think Indonesia can in particular benefit from cooperating with China and with India in, in going green in its uh, energy sector. So in short, the answer is yes. Uh, green New Deal is a, a hugely important scheme, particularly in Europe. And yes, Indonesia can learn from it, but no, Indonesia cannot copy it. Indonesia will need to make its own decision based on economic its own experiences. And also, also for sure, make sure that the jobs coming from this shift is jobs for Indonesian people. United States, I mean, Joe Biden has called his scheme the American Job uh, Program. And in the same way, Indonesia can establish the Indonesian job program, uh, which is going green. Okay, thank you, Eric. Uh, and uh, okay, so the next question is, I think, for uh, from uh, Pia Dan Howard. Uh, she has uh, devastation and forest fires have also impacted as a, a ASEAN neighbors. To what extent has regional cooperation contributed to current positive developments in environmental management? And what are the remaining hurdles? And what can be improved in ASEAN co cooperation in the future? Uh, I think all panelists can, can jump to answer, uh, jump in to answer the, this question. Probably we can start from Mr. Trencher. Uh, Richard? Yeah, um, certainly we've seen the devastating forest fires here over the years, particularly a few years ago. Um, and whilst the a lot of work has been done to reduce the risks. As I said, we know they remain. Um, and certainly with the larger ones, the impact across the, sub, the region was enormous, we know. Um, but I'm not particularly a forest fire specialist, but thankfully I have with me uh, Pak Adam, who is. So if it's okay, can I um, thrust Pak, the, or can I, hand, can I hand the microphone over to you, Pak Adam? Um, particularly on the regional dimension of uh, forest fire management. Pak Adam, please. Okay, uh, thanks, Pak Dick. And I hope my colleagues from Indonesia are also able to compliment because this is, they are the, the members, of course, from um, participants of, of ASEAN. But firstly, let me say that ASEAN did take a very strong stand on this because of the regional impacts of uh, smoke and haze. Uh, it's actually not just haze, it's toxic. Uh, the more we study the, the fires, particularly from peatlands. Uh, and this has been a really good initiative that, um, that ASEAN has done. And Indonesia has been an active participant. Indonesia is the host country for ASEAN and very involved. Uh, and takes this very seriously when there are fires because it is a diplomatic issue between countries. Um, so the, the engagement of ASEAN, uh, recognizing that the, when fires get very big, they are a transboundary issue. And in fact, as uh, Eric has pointed out, and as we are realizing, many of these things to do with forests are global issues. Deforestation has global impacts. It doesn't just affect the one country. So ASEAN taking a, a regional stand and having a, an agreement on this uh, and then having countries to actively report and monitor on it is a really good initiative. And Indonesia has been an active participant in that. Um, so from our side in the FAO, uh, looking at things internationally, this is a very encouraging regional cooperation. And I think it's a, it's a very good initiative. Um, I think it's due for renewal. And it will be interesting to see whether, whether that happens and how it happens, whether it will be strengthened and in terms of how countries uh, respond and, and I hope also funding be made available to encourage countries and to support those countries that are not able to, to deal with these uh, factors or need help in terms of technical support or finance. Um, Indonesia is a large country and it's got a lot of technical experience and obviously some demonstrated success now on reducing deforestation. So in terms of ASEAN, I, I, I hope that Indonesia will use its, uh, its ability there and its influence and also its expertise to share that with other countries in the region. 
Um, so I'll stop there. And if Indonesia is able to add, if any of the panel members are able to add some comments, uh, I think it would be very useful. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Pak Adam. Uh, Bu Belinda, would you like to add something uh, about ASEAN uh, cooperation? Mm, yeah, maybe I'm not the right person to really answer this, but I think I would like to have uh, to mention that it's already a collaboration in the smoke uh, and haze transboundary between Indonesia and ASEAN country. And it is uh, really true that uh, due to the forest fire, the land and forest fire in 2015 that actually uh, really create the smoke haze uh, transboundary. Uh, the government of Indonesia uh, uh, really work hard uh, uh, to reduce uh, the fire effect is not only for the haze, but uh, and that can be seen uh, can be seen uh, from the change of the paradigm uh, from the uh, suppression into prevention. Uh, that 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 is actually the 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 real work done by the Indonesia, uh, and I think that is also uh, due to some. Uh, a discussion with the Asian country. And I think uh, since that year, there is no other uh, problem with our uh, neighboring country. And there is no uh, haze uh, that actually uh, come uh, due to the land and forest fire uh, from from Indonesia. That is a maybe, maybe I can answer from that. But I do believe that uh, I think support from many uh, partner and many stakeholder uh, can really improve uh, in how uh, we really maintain the forest fire on the ground because it's, it is not really easy, especially when we reach the area of the pit because pit it's really difficult to handle regarding the land and uh, forest fire. <clears throat> okay, thank you, uh, Bu Belinda. Uh... Pa Eric, would you like to add something about uh, ASEAN cooperation? Uh, this is a great question, and thank you for raising it. And let me start just by saying that ASEAN is becoming more and more important uh, by the day as a cooperation mechanism for Southeast Asia. Just to show you the importance of ASEAN, uh, we just got the, uh, the economic uh, review figures from China for the first quarter of this year. The Chinese economy grew by 18%, of uh, course, compared to last year with the COVID, but still is absolutely unprecedented. And ASEAN is now the biggest trade partner with China in the world. It's not the United States, it's not Europe, it's ASEAN. So the race of ASEAN and ASEAN countries is absolutely uh, enormous, and the importance of ASEAN should never be undercounted. It, it, it's incredible. And I think in two different ways, ASEAN can, can help, uh, of course, to, the, uh, to exchange best practice, practice and, um, uh, and good ideas between governments is very helpful. There were some complications between Indonesia and Singapore a few years back, and Singaporeans complained about the haze uh, coming, coming basically from Sumatra uh, deforestation. Uh, but the Indonesian um, uh, minister said the right thing. They said, we are fighting deforestation for the people of Indonesia, not for someone else, for Indonesia. This is about the future of our children. And of course, that was the right answer. And then gradually the relationship has uh, on this has improved. Uh, and I think Singapore has a lot to offer, but so has other uh, nations. So cooperating on political level is very important. Adding there is another business angle because many of the big companies investing in the forest in Indonesia are registered or have headquarters outside Indonesia, very often in Singapore. Singapore is a prime business hub of the world, one of the best for business. Uh, and of course, governments have a very important role to play in regulating the business environment so that it's easy for business to move into the green sectors. So from a business point of view, it's also very important that Indonesia work together with, for instance, Singapore, but also with other, other nations, so that uh, there are a joint view as to how to regulate business to drive it to go green. Okay, thank you, Pa Eric. Uh, 
Uh, next question is uh, from Hafidin. Uh, I think this is for Ibu Belinda. Regarding governmental po policy on declining deforestation, how do you implement red policy through government rules in, in the local sector? So how, how a red, policy, red policies are uh, distributed through uh, government <laughs> regulations, especially probably in local administrations, I guess. This is, this is the question, Ibu Belinda. Okay. I will try to answer. Uh, that actually, uh, that is also a discussion in, in how to make that the money come to the right person. That is always an issue. And how the money that actually already collected can be delivered to the people, that, that is always the question. And actually, uh, there is already a, a specific unit, uh, I, I don't know in English, but Mbak Aditi, ini kayak BLU gitu. Oh, special uh, purpose vehicle. I think. Yes, it's yes, like okay. uh, uh, that is actually yes. the special unit under okay. the Ministry of Finance. It's not under the Ministry of Environment and Forestry, but it's under the Ministry of Finance that actually uh, work uh, di Direktorat PKF ini ya, uh, work to, to, to get or to collect all the money uh, that come from the result-based payment of the red plus and following the discussion even though i'm not really follow the discussion recently but uh, we know that actually uh, there is already an, uh, an idea and to uh, uh, to select the specific bank that actually can uh, use uh, or can uh, can use by the people uh, to access to assess uh, to access to access the, the the money from this uh, PLU or uh, this unit, of course, uh, in order to get this uh, fund, uh, actually, uh, the important of MRV is uh, is is a must. So because all the payment, all the payment usually have to go through the MRV processes. That's why. Uh, so far, if I'm uh, not uh, mistakenly, that is under the BLU, there is also a, a, a unit, uh, a specific unit that actually also maintain uh, the MRV process. So all the people that actually uh, it's already work on the ground and it's already uh, approved that there are some reduction of the emission in that specific uh, province, for instance, then there will be a process under this uh, new unit of the BLU uh, following all the regulation uh, because the regulation is already under the uh, government government regulation number 46 year 2017 uh, and how people can access that i'm not really update with the detail because uh, now i'm not really work in this area anymore but uh, and when we prepare this there is already a, a sim or the scenario uh, how the money that has been collected within the specific unit can be distributed to specific bank a specific bank that is already uh, selected by the, the unit after okay. they pass the mrv process Okay, Ibu, so uh, this uh, finance ministry unit uh, will do the assessment and then deliver the money to the local administration, something yes. like that. Yes, something like that, because it's not all the bank. It's, it should be some specific bank. And okay. there should be uh, some uh, selected uh, criteria that they have to fulfill this criteria. I'm not really updated with this kind of information. Maybe we have to, you have to invite a people from the Ministry of Finance for these issues. Okay, Ibu Belinda, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, our next question <laughs> is, uh, I think this is uh, for Pa Eric and Pa Richard, who have discussed so much, so much about uh, the role of business sector. Uh, so the question uh, is from Hafidin. Uh, how uh, how business uh, business uh, sector how business attitude should be in line with environmental ethics and press ethics to ensure 
government policy on deforestation well implemented. So yeah, uh, probably Pak Richard, would you like to start? I, I was actually going to suggest that Pak Eric kicked off oh, okay. because I spoke so enthusiastically on this, but I'll happily add some thoughts afterwards. Okay, so Pak Eric, would you would you jump jump to answer? Jump into answer? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, I think there are uh, basic, I and mean, there are two reasons why business are not changing all over the world. Number one is that business leaders are also human beings, like, like political leaders or like citizens. They understand that we need to change to protect uh, future generations, uh, their own children and grandchildren, uh, but to pro provide for, for a, be a better world. And in many parts of the world, frankly, business is not well ahead of politicians. In my nation, Norway, the main business leaders are much, much more knowledgeable of environment issues, much more de dedicated, uh, and much more acting than the political leaders. So, uh, the, so business leaders, they are citizens and they want to change. But the second is, of course, they see the enormous business opportunities in this change. Uh, look to the United States. Uh, President Biden has set out, as I said, the greenest agenda ever in the United States. But he's never talking about all the problems of climate change and environment destruction. He's not speaking about the hurricanes or the forest fires or the sea level rise or any of the other problems. It's just speaking about the opportunities, how going green is the new job opportunity for the United States. By the way, there are already five times more jobs in the United States in solar and energy than there is in coal. And of course, there will be in the future many, many more jobs. So I think these are the two main reasons business are changes, the citizens, but they also see the enormous opportunities uh, for this. And of course, in Indonesia, that means there is already more than sufficient land for Indonesia uh, to use uh, for palm oil or for, for other, uh, other areas. Uh, and there is uh, more than enough land uh, for the paper and pulp industry to, to expand. So there is no reason to destroy one single square meter of the forest uh, for Indonesia uh, to prosper. So we need government regulations because business needs to be fair and those who want to move for the environment do not to be, want to be undercut by the latecomers and the evildoers. So you need government regulations to frame the market. But then I think we can be very, very confident uh, that business will, will go along. And of course, in Indonesia, I think it's also a matter of generations. There was a previous generation who was completely focused on development, uh, did that well. But now there's a new generation coming up in these companies, second generation of them, and they are much, much more environmentally aware. And they see the opportunities for business in, in, in going green. And by the way, this is a global phenomenon. Microsoft is much, much greener than any government in the United States up to this point. Uh, IKEA, the big Swedish furniture company, is much more into a circular economy than any government in Europe, just to give you a, a couple of examples. And last week, Volkswagen, uh, which is the biggest or second biggest car company in the world, said the debate is over. We will not com continue with the, combust uh, the combust uh, combustion engine, uh, the gasoline engine. We will go all out for the electric vehicles because we think it's good for the environment, but because it, we believe it's good for our business. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Yeah, and I just just to add, I think um, back Eric has really nailed the answer and the issues um, that clearly the role of government around the world and here is to shape and design the policy frameworks that incentivize good behavior, disincentivize or sanction bad behavior. Um, and also it's, you know, the, the type of change that we're talking about here and elsewhere will be driven by the private sector guided and in collaboration with the public sector, the government. And I think, you know, we look here at the Association of Indonesian Forest Concession Holders, the APHI, really working closely with the ministry to really look at putting in place sustainable forest management um, practices, et cetera, et cetera, which are fully aligned with government policy. And that's the way to go. 
An area that I know a bit more about or something about is fisheries, and it's the same for forestry. We have the laws, we have the people who are understanding, as, as Pat Eric was saying, and fully embracing the new directions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But you will always see illegal, or unregulated, or unauthorized um, behavior as well here and elsewhere. And this is why enforcement is incredibly important. A government that is seen to have the legislation in place, to have the commitment to enforce that, and to chase after people when they break the laws, whether we're talking about forestry, whether we're talking about fisheries and the like. Um, so we know that good policy, design, investment is really key, but also, unfortunately, we also have to have um, uh, strong enforcement regimes. And I think that the ministry and the government in general is really pushing its commitment around this area to chase after people who are involved. But let me hand over to Ibel Belinda, who can speak far more directly on this issue, of course. Yeah, Ibel Belinda, would you like to add uh, something? <laughs> yeah, is it is it uh, enough? Is it? Oh. I think yeah. Um, I probably I just want to say something that uh, the commitment of the government is really the important thing. Meaning, when there is a commitment, the strong commitment, so all the unit will work in the same direction. So they, they, they will give a really uh, show the significant effect of, of the work because if everybody work hard but goes to different direction, there will be no effect that we can see. So when uh, the direction is clear and the commitment is clear, that will be easy uh, for everybody uh, to really reach uh, the goal. Uh, maybe that is the thing. So uh, we are really proud that uh, the last year, the year 2020, we can reach the lowest uh, deforestation uh, rate uh, we have so far. And uh, that is also surprised us, uh, but we already check and recheck again, again, because we, uh, we want to make sure that everything is right. And we also, uh, but, here, I would like to uh, mention also to the public that the, the deforestation information that the government of Indonesia released is actually not done only on the lab, but the work is also done uh, from the people on the ground on, in the field because uh, our regional offices uh, all around uh, Indonesia that actually work hard uh, to make all the, uh, the map and again, check it whether everything is correct or not. Uh, what we have done in the uh, central government is uh, the quality control to make sure that all this information are correct uh, based on that. So I would say that this is the layering step. So I, uh, uh, I, I, would, I would like to say that we are really serious in this uh, situation and this uh, issue then uh, we try to do our best uh, to provide the information that can be trustable uh, and can be accepted uh, by people and can be accepted by the MRV, uh, global MRV. Maybe that's the thing that I, I, I would like to uh, highlight in this issue following what Jess explained. Thank okay. you. Okay, thank if, you. If, if you really allow me to give one example. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Yes. Yeah, uh, I have been advising April, as you know, it's the biggest paper and pulp company in the world. It has main business in Indonesia, but it's headquartered in, in Singapore. They released a strategy a few months back called April 2030 about their environment and social commitments, which are very, very impressive. And now they could, uh, they could tell the, the public that they have achieved a complete sustainable supply chain uh, for the paper and pulp uh, factories three years ahead of schedule. Everyone can, can challenge it. They can look into the figures on which are, are, are public if there are some crit critics out there. But it's an amazing positive result. And of course, it's an integrated operation with Indonesia. They have a huge number of factories also in China. 
so uh, th this is a uh, very, very positive, positive, de uh, positive development. Could it have happened without the government of Indonesia? No. Uh, even if business want to go green, they need the blessing, the support, uh, and the framing of the market, as we heard here, uh, from the government. So this, the, this interplay between business and government and citizens, which is now driving in such a positive uh, direction, and this April 2030 strategy is one of many examples of that. Okay. Uh, thank you, Pai Eric. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we are closing to the end of this webinar. Uh, so I would like to invite uh, all the speakers to give uh, closing remarks, uh, starting from uh, Ibu Belinda. Thank you, um, Mbak Adisti, uh, uh, the participant. Uh, maybe I just want to say that this is a good opportunity uh, for the government to really show uh, the work so far. As mentioned in the beginning also, that some people maybe say this is a good thing, but there are some people that still skeptic, or maybe they don't really understand the issue they're talking about. Because uh, I still, I still, you know, I still uh, find uh, some confusing for the people. Uh, even, even the media itself, sometimes they put the information not really in the uh, right uh, position. Uh, maybe they mix the information uh, like definition or mix the, the, the clarity of all the information. That is, it is true. So in this uh, situation, I, I would like uh, to invite all people to really uh, try to find the right information, not only just check or what it's mentioned by many people, but try to uh, track the, info, the right information from the right source. The right source. So if, for instance, if the information about the country itself, meaning they have to check uh, but the information released by the country. And if they don't really trust the information by the country, for instance, that is uh, it's possible sometimes. But uh, here, uh, if they have questioning uh, the information regarding the deforestation of the Indonesia itself, uh, here again, I would like to highlight that our system, our information system has been uh, globally MR fit by independent reviewer. And so I think that it should be a, a, a indication for this. Uh, lastly, I would like to thank to the Jakarta Post. This is a good opportunity for us to really uh, deliver uh, the information to the public. Then people can uh, understand more about the issues, uh, the raising issues that sometimes are really confused by uh, many people. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ibu Belinda. Uh, next, maybe uh, Pak Eric, uh, your, uh, your closing remarks. Uh, when we want to resolve environment issues in our day, it may sometimes be useful to think of how we resolved them in the past. And maybe the most shining example of environment success story is the hole in the ozone layer. That was the main environment problem if you go 30 years back. That was what the entire global debate was all about how we avoid all this cancer coming from uh, the, uh, the, the human destruction of the ozone layer. Well, governments came together to regulate markets. Business made all the new technologies and all the new products we needed. We have much more air conditioning in the world today than we had at the time, uh, just to do it without harming the ozone layer. And citizens said, we don't want to live this way any longer. And they put pressure on governments and, and business. Now the ozone layer is coming back, and by 2050, it's completely restored. So exactly the same uh, will be the success story here, and is the success story here. Governments, business, and citizens moving in the right direction. And I will really, really pay tribute to and thank, for sure, President Okovi, Ibu City, but also Ibu Belinda and the many, many hardworking uh, people in the government and the civil service of Indonesia. You have pulled off this. And then thank the business for making the change. Uh, because business, yes, uh, 
contributed to large uh, deforestation in the past, but it's not part of the solution uh, rather than part of the problem. And the many non-governmental organizations and citizens of Indonesia and the world uh, and the UN entities and others who have uh, pushed this change. And when these three forces come together, government regulations, uh, the enormous um, creativity of business and the push from civil society and citizens, then uh, we will be able to resolve any problem. We will resolve deforestation and we make the change into renewables, which we needed. Finally, please, Indonesia, take credit for what you're doing. Please tell this success story to the world. Don't be so modest. This is a fantastic story, and we all should uh, we should all tell this so that the world come to know because then people will be inspired in Latin America, Africa, Europe, everywhere else about what you have achieved in Indonesia, and they can do likewise. Okay, thank you, Pa Eric, uh, Pa Richard, uh, your just just remarks? just very quickly. Um, here's a fact for you: uh, FAO was established in the embers, the dying days of the Second World War in 1945. One of our first programs, one of our longest running programs is the FRA, the Forest Resource Assessment. This is where we work with governments to collect information on forests. It's, it's, it's one of FAO's longest running programs. It's uh, 75 years plus now. And this is all about collecting information and as Ibu Belinda said exactly, there's an enormous amount of information that conforms to international standards and the like. It's really complicated. The forest technicians really like detail and, and definitional uh, complexity. It's absolutely important that we understand and we use the right data, whether we're talking about afforestation, reforestation, deforestation and forest loss, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, these issues are incredibly important really important it's really important that we know what evidence and information we're using to make the cases etc because sometimes it's very easy to get tangled up in this web of definitional complexity the information is there and the definitions are there sometimes they're a bit hard to understand but it's but, but it's what it's really important particularly when you have a government like indonesia which is so committed and so strong at being transparent it's really trying to use and apply state-of-the-art technologies and analytics to get the information out there. Um, I'm not for a second saying that scrutiny isn't important. It's really important that we look at this. It's really important that we have champions who hold accountable governments in the private sector, etc., not just here, but globally. But also it's really important that we recognize the work that Indonesia is doing. And the state of Indonesia's Forest 220 is a really good example. It's a shining example of what transparency looks like. Um, and the third and final point, yes, there is no doubt, as we've all said, as Pak Eric has said very, very forcefully, the achievements of Indonesia, the government, the communities, the people, the private sector in reducing deforestation are really, really important. They're really great. They should be given visibility and acknowledged and, and celebrated in many ways because of, of what they represent. The really important thing, like any great achievement, is you don't stop now. You know, we have the commitment that's really important. We have the policy frameworks. We have the constant drive and energy to carry on pursuing this because it's it's something that needs the type of attention it has now. So fantastic work. It's great. It's something to really celebrate. But at the same time, we know that we have to double our efforts rather than lean back and say, job well done. It's something that needs continuous attention. But thank you very much indeed, Jack Post, for organizing it. Another fascinating uh, um, webinar. Thanks also to the other colleagues for speaking, particularly uh, Ibu Belinda and, and Pak Eric. And um, yeah, thank you to all the participants for joining and for so many really challenging and good questions, some of which we were able to answer both in questions and also in writing. And thank you, Adam, for all that. Talina Kassi. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Parichard. Uh, that's a powerful message to end our session today. Uh, and now, uh, I'd like to invite all speakers to turn on your cameras uh, to take pictures together. Uh, Ibu Belinda, uh, Pak Eric, uh, Pak Richard, and Pak Adam, would you, would you please turn on your camera so we can take the picture together? Is it, is it ready now? Uh, one, two, three. Yes. Once again, one, two, three. 
Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much to all speakers. Uh, that's a wrap uh, for our discussion today. Uh, thanks to all the participants. Uh, stay healthy, stay happy, and see you again in our next webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye, Eric. Thank you, all of you. Yeah.